right. Uh, Father in heaven, we are very thankful to be here this evening. Uh, very uh, grateful to have life and and uh, liberty. And as uh, we continue to contemplate your ways and means of taking care of our body, help us to understand how much healing power you've done and uh, given in these simple ways and give you the honor and glory. Amen. 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 Well, welcome to our 26th Medical Missionary Phone Class. And our opening verse is 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Many people don't realize that we are the temple of God. And they're just treating this, this temple in a horrible way. We need to reach these people. The topic tonight is dress. And from the Ministry of Healing, we're bringing out uh, many things. And then also there's some added quotes and thoughts from the Bible that I would like to add to it tonight. And we'll go ahead and start with the Ministry of Healing questions in the study guide. Question number one is a fill in the blank, so I'm going to read the, uh, the actual quote. It says, The Bible teaches modesty in dress, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. This forbids display in dress, gaudy colors, profuse ornamentation. Any device designed to attract attention to the wearer or to excite admiration is excluded from the modest apparel which God's Word enjoins. So here we have um, anything that's designed to attract attention or to excite admiration. So the reason as Christians that we don't want to do this is that we want all glory and all admiration to go to God and not to ourselves. And then continuing on, it says, Our dress is to be inexpensive, not with gold or pearls or costly array. All right, question two. It says, Look for one or two word descriptions of proper dress and write them here as you find them. It says, But our clothing, while modest, and simple should be of good quality, of becoming colors, and suited for service. It should be chosen for durability rather than display. It should provide warmth and proper protection. And then it gives this quote, Proverbs 31, 21, it says, The wise woman is not afraid of the snow of her, for her household, for all her household are clothed with double garments. And another place is called scarlet. It's clothed with scarlet, which means double garments. And when you wear double garments, it's like an insulation. It's so much better for you, especially on your limbs, as we're going to be talking about tonight. Continuing on in Ministry of Healing, it says, Our dress should be cleanly. Uncleanness in dress is unhealthful and thus defiling to the body and to the soul. Ye are the temple of God. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Continuing on, the next paragraph, uh, page 289, paragraph 1 we're on. It says, It should have the grace the beauty, the appropriateness of natural simplicity. Christ has warned us against the pride of life, but not against its grace and natural beauty. He pointed to the flowers of the field, to the lily unfolding in its purity, and said, Even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Matthew 6, verse 29. Thus, by the things of nature... Christ illustrates the beauty that heaven values, the modest grace, the simplicity, the purity, the appropriateness, 
that would make our attire pleasing to him. Uh, the next paragraph says, The most beautiful dress he bids us wear upon the soul. No outward adorning can compare in value or loveliness with that meek and quiet spirit, which is in his sight a great price. First Peter four, I'm sorry, first Peter three, verse four. So we can have the most gorgeous and fancy and jewels, but a meek and quiet spirit is so much more appealing in loveliness. Question two, what results do the constantly changing fashions, fashion trends produce upon a family's finances, health, home, or children? This is found in 290 and 291. We need to take in consideration the time that this book was written, which was in the 1800s when the fashions were a lot more expensive. The average fashion, that is, was a lot more expensive than they are now. Um, it says, Think of the styles that have prevailed for the last few hundreds of years or even for the last few decades. How many of them, when not in fashion, would be declared immodest? How many would pr be pronounced inappropriate for a refined, God-fearing, self-respecting woman? Now, back then they had, you know, trailing skirts. They had corsets that tightened up the, the stomach and the lungs so that they could hardly breathe. And they'd have fainting chairs and just all kinds of fashions. Hoops where you'd have to raise the hoop to be able to get into a, a car or a coach and but what about today well we just went through maybe about 15 10 years ago where the midriff was showing and now we've just just gotten I think we're over it maybe not maybe I'm just gotten used to looking at it but the really low necklines and so we go in and out of these fashions and in order to keep up with it we have to change our our clothing but we're not to be subject to that. Question four, who instigated the invention of the ever-changing fashions? It says it was the adversary of all good who instigated the invention of the ever-changing fashions. Okay, so um, number five, it says, what was wrong with the skirt that sweeps the ground? It says, um, the wearing of skirts so that their weight, let's see, I don't know that I wrote that answer down from the book, but anyway, it, it picks up the filth of the ground, and then it picks up the dew, which then causes it to be wet around the, the um, ends, and then that wetness goes on to the ankles, and it chills back the blood into the internal organs. And then... Um, we also have uh, tight lacings. We have skirts that are so heavy that um, it weighs down on the internal organs or t the waist is too tight. Question six. It says, God is the author of what? So it's giving some blanks here. And the answer is, God is the author of all beauty. And only as we conform to his ideal shall we approach the standard of true beauty? Question seven. What special care should be given the feet and limbs? This is page 293. It says another evil which custom fosters is the unequal distribution of the clothing so that while some parts of the body have more than is required, others are insufficiently clad. The feet and limbs which is your arms and legs, being remote from the vital organs, should be especially guarded from cold by abundant clothing. It is impossible to have health when the extremities are habitually cold, for if there is too little blood in them, there will be too much in other portions of the body. Perfect health requires a perfect circulation, but this cannot be had while three or four times as much clothing is worn upon the body 
where the vital organs are situated as upon the feet and limbs. So this has been um, a fashion in our day, especially with the nylons coming into style. People have, you know, the they've got a sweater and they've got a, maybe a long johns in the shirt and, and then they've got the skirt and maybe even uh, long johns in the upper part, but then the lower limbs are nylons, which does not give any warmth. If anything, the nylon picks up the coldness and transfers it even more. Another thing is the synthetic clothing will also not absorb the toxins that the body is continually throwing off. We have thousands of little mouths on our skin and it, they breathe and they, they let out toxins and they take in things on our skin. If you don't want to eat it, you shouldn't put it on your skin because the lotions and things go right into your system. Continuing on, this is found in Child Guidance, page 426, paragraph 3, and 427, paragraph 1. It says, In order to follow the fashions, mothers dress their children with limbs nearly naked, and the blood is chilled back from its natural course and thrown upon the internal organs, breaking up the circulation and producing disease. The limbs were not formed by our Creator to endure exposure, as was the face. The Lord provided also large veins and nerves for the limbs and feet to contain a large amount of the current of human life, that the limbs might be uniformly as warm as the body. They should be so thoroughly clothed as to induce the blood to the extremities. Now, we were at the Wellness Center in 1975 to 1980, working under Dr. Charlotte Holmes, and she was of the mindset that you really needed to keep evenly clad, even clothing all over your body. And she promoted uh, virgin wool even because it really keeps the blood close to the skin. And also there's a verse in the Bible that says that lambs are for our clothing, which is the first cutting off of a lamb doesn't itch like regular wool. So it's called virgin wool. And anyway, we were taught by her to help health guests to understand this concept. And we would see it over and over whenever there was a person with arthritis or asthma, they would come and they would put on their, their long johns, their wool long johns. And their arthritis immediately started getting better. Pain in their joints would go away. Um, because their blood was evenly distributed. Any itis is a condition where there's just too much blood in a certain area. So then the blood was evenly distributed, took the pain away. An asthma attack is the same thing. Too much congestion going on in the lungs. So if you evenly distribute it, it takes the, the attack away. Uh, we had people that would take off their long johns and then they would get an attack and they would immediately say, I need to put these back on. And they would put them on and they would feel so much better. You can also equalize the circulation with an asthma attack very nicely by putting them in a tepid bath. And that's where the, the water is right at body temperature or just a tiny bit below. And just stay in there. And that equalizes the circulation. And then we would do this even in the summertime. We noticed a difference. I did an experiment one time. It was about maybe seven years after I was doing this evenly clad. And, and I do it in the summertime also that I wear something on my limbs, try to stay evenly clad all over my body. And so in the summertime, it was like 90 degrees. And I was in this, uh, this mobile home. It was very hot. And we didn't have air conditioning. And so I decided to give it a try. So I took off my long johns, ran around in a short and shorts and short sleeve t-shirt, you know, in my house. And I, before I did that, though, I took my blood pressure and my uh, heart rate. Because I'm, I'm a scientist at heart, so I'm always testing things. And so, you know, it was normal. And then after I walked around with the shorts and the t-shirt on and I did my housework and then I rested and I did my pulse and my blood pressure and they were both quite a bit higher than they were 
before I took my clothes off. So then I put my long johns back on and I waited about an hour and I took my blood pressure and my pulse again and they were back down to normal. So it, it does affect our health. And when our limbs are chilled back, because you know when it's hot out, you're going to sweat. And that sweat and the air hitting it cools your limbs. Now if you are, especially with wool, it keeps your leg warm even though you're sweating and but you still feel cool and I actually feel more comfortable when I have evenly clad than when I when I've taken the clothes off and you know bore my limbs I think it's probably because I've been doing it for 38 years and so I'm just so comfortable with it but you have to get used to it for a while it might take a little bit to get used to the next quote here that I'm going to read out of Child Guidance, it says, Satan invented the fashions which leave the limbs exposed, chilling back the life current from its original course. And parents bow at the shrine of fashion and so clothe their children that the nerves and veins become contracted and do not answer the purpose that God designed they should. The result is habitually cold feet and hands. Those parents who follow fashion instead of reason will have an account to render to God for thus robbing their children of health. Even life itself is frequently sacrificed to the God of fashion. Question 8 is list some qualities of healthful clothing. And this is found in, on page 293, paragraph 3. It says, In order to secure the most healthful clothing, the needs of every part of the body must be carefully studied the character of the climate, the surroundings, the condition of health, the age, and the occupation must all be considered. Every article of dress should fit easily, obstructing neither the circulation of the blood nor a free, full, natural respiration. Everything worn should be so loose that when the arms are raised, the clothing will be correspondingly lifted. You know, if it's a hot climate, you're going to want to wear, like, cotton that's for sure and it you know a blouse top or a type fabric you wouldn't want knits are more hot than the uh, regular shirt or blouse fabric and also if you are working up on a roof you might consider wearing white where your clothes will reflect the sun instead of take in the sun and I don't know if you've ever noticed how the Arabs dress in the desert, but they have on such thick wool and on their heads also because it acts as a insulation against the sun and the heat. You wouldn't see them trying to travel through the desert with bare skin. That wouldn't work. Question 9 says, List some of the things a woman should do instead of becoming a mere household drudge. This is page 294. It says, let women themselves, instead of struggling to meet the demands of fashion, of course, back then, you had to make your own clothes, you know, you didn't have to, but everything was so expensive, you were obliged to. The cost of goods were a lot more than they are now. We don't, they didn't have things coming from China. And the laces, that they, they were handmade. And so they spent a lot of time trying to meet the demands of fashion. It says, instead of doing this, have the courage to dress healthfully and simply. Instead of sinking into a mere household drudge, let the wife and mother take time to read, to keep herself well informed, to be a companion to her husband, and to keep in touch with the developing minds of her children. Let her use wisely the opportunities, now hers, to influence her dear ones for the higher life. Let her take time to make the sa dear Savior a daily companion and familiar friend. Let her take time for the study of his word, and take time to go with the children into the fields and learn of God through the beauty of his works. Ministry of Healing, 294, paragraph 1. Okay. The Holy Spirit can teach us about how important it is. I want to read a quote about how powerful the Holy Spirit can be to us. 
And this is found in Maranatha 23, paragraph 3. It says, God can teach you more in one moment by His Holy Spirit than you could learn from the great men of the earth. The universe is looking upon the controversy that is going on upon the earth. At an infinite cost, God has provided for every man an opportunity to know that which will make him wise unto salvation. How eagerly do the angels look to see who will avail himself of this opportunity. When a message is presented to God's people, they should not rise up in opposition to it. They should go to the Bible, comparing it with the law and the testimony. And if it does not bear this test, it is not true. God wants our minds to expand. He desires to put His grace upon us. We may have a feast of good things every day, for God can open the whole treasure of heaven to us. So this is a wonderful promise that we can have our minds expand because we accept these things that he gives us. And there's, I want to continue on a little bit from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy on dress, taking in some other issues. And this one is found in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 7. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And we're talking about dress. We know, we saw what happened to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they chose the diet and how God set them on high in that area. Well, let's take this with the dress today. In Acts the Apostle 600, it says, The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth, empowered by Him to do a special work. And if she is loyal to Him, obedient to all of His commandments, there will dwell within her the excellency of divine grace. If she will be true to her allegiance, if she will honor the Lord God of Israel, there is no power that can stand against her. Now that's a precious promise. And continuing on, Acts the Apostles, page 601, says, If the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. This is symbolic. Christ wants to put his robe of righteousness on us. And so when we think about our dress, Let's think about how it reflects this robe of Christ's righteousness. If the church will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing from all allegiance with the world, there is before her the dawn of a bright and glorious day. God's promise to her will stand fast forever. He will make her an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. You know, we need to consider about what we put on our bodies. I'm going to read Numbers 15, 38 through 41. God had given the children of Israel a symbol of something that made them think of the commandments. And this is what, when people look at us, they need to think of purity, love, giving to others because we are not trying to spend so much on ourselves. They need to see all this in our dress. They need to see humbleness. They need to see the commandments. A lie, you know, thou shalt not lie. We can lie with our clothes. Okay, Numbers 15, 38 through 41. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they Put upon the fringes, the borders, a ribbon of blue. So this is what they put on the border, was a ribbon of blue. There is many books that we can study on dress. And if you're interested in going a little bit deeper, we're kind of just touching the surface here tonight. But there's a website out there called movingtowardmodesty.com. And there's a long list of 
articles that you can read and books, suggested books to read and quotes from the Bible that you can read. MovingTowardModesty.com Okay, continuing on in Numbers 15, it says, And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a-whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God, I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. And all these blessings. Now, this is if, if we do this, if we have this ribbon of blue, if we have this dress that reminds us of the commandments. It says, And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt thou be, shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, the increase of thy kine, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shalt thy, shall be thy basket, and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. And here is the, the main verse on dress in the Bible. It's found in Deuteronomy 22 verse 5. It says, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God now as medical missionaries striving to heal and have God work through us and to show his love through us we we want to stay far away from things that are an abomination unto the Lord thy God because if we are an abomination to God he cannot use us so if women are putting on things that pertain to a man or a man is striving to look like a woman then we know right there that we are not going to have success we're not going to be blessed in the field nor or neither will our basket be blessed or our store be blessed and when people come after us they're not going to be able to flee seven ways so we need to understand what is this abomination before I get into a little bit more on that I want to read some in I want to read a quote from Isaiah Isaiah 3.16 Isaiah 3.16 through 26 So it says, Moreover the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks, and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite, with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments, ornaments about their feet, and their calls, and their round tires like the moon, that these are things that they put around their neck. The chains, and the bracelets, and the mufflers, the bonnets, and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and the tablets, and the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins and the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. And it shall come to pass that instead of a sweet smell, there shall be a stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of well-set hair, baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty." Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, being desolate, shall sit upon the ground. And the next chapter, verse 1, that was the end of chapter 3, chapter 4, verse 1, says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread, and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name, to take away our reproach. 
So let's not be like this, where we want to do what we want to do, or maybe we don't want to do it. Maybe we, we are born again. But maybe the old man is alive and wants to do these things. So we can't do that and then be called by his name, just thinking that's going to save us. Okay, and on this verse of 22.5, there's some quotes in the Spirit of Prophecy that I'd like to bring out. This one's in 1T421, paragraph 3. It says, There is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress and appearance as near like the other sex as possible, and to fashion their dress very much like that of men. But God pronounces it abomination. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. And then 1T459, paragraph 7, it says, Those who feel called out to join the movement in favor of women's rights and the so-called dress reform might as well sever all connection with the third angel's message. The spirit which attends the one cannot be in harmony with the other. So let's find out what this so-called dress reform is. Because it says here that if we adopt it, that we might as well sever our connection with the third angel's message. And that's the message of, uh, that we are to be calling out to, to people to come out of Babylon. And... We're not going to be able to do that if we are actually still in Babylon. So here is from 1T, again, 359, continuing on. It says, there is still another style of dress which is adopted by a class of so-called dress reformers. And here it goes in a little bit more in detail what it is. They imitate the opposite sex as nearly as possible. They wear the cap, pants, vest, coat, and boots the last of which is the most sensible part of the costume. Those who adopt and advocate this style of dress carry the so-called dress reform to very objectionable lengths. Confusion will be the result. Some who adopt this costume may be correct in their general views upon the health question because they, in, in this dress they had the clothing suspended from the shoulders, there was nothing heavy on the waist, they were evenly clad, but the skirt that they were wearing with it was above the knee and the pants were showing, of course. And then they had like a, a jacket that, that looked a lot like man. Let's see. Some who adopt this custom may be correct in their general views upon the health question, but they would be instrumental in accomplishing vastly more good if they did not carry the matter of dress to such extremes. And continuing on, it says... In this style of dress, God's order has been reversed and his special directions disregarded. Deuteronomy 22, 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. God would not have his people adopt this style of dress. It is not modest apparel, and it is not at all fitting for modest, humble women who profess to be Christ followers. God's prohibitions are lightly regarded by all who advocate doing away with the distinction of dress between males and females. So this is the main issue, that, that there's not a distinction of dress between male and females. I mean, they were still wearing the, the skirt, but it was short, and the pants were extremely showing. It says, The extreme position taken by some dress reformers call upon this subject cripples their influence. So that's basically the end of the dress, except for hair. I'm going to talk about that. I encourage you to go into it a little bit more, but as medical missionaries, wanting success from the Lord, we must have the proper attire and be modest and be having everything reflecting to God, not trying to draw, uh, draw attention to ourselves in any way. Okay, the hair is found on 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 through 7. And 
It says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now you're probably wondering what this covering is. We're going to read that. It's uh, continuing on the same chapter, 11, verses 13 and 14 answers it. It says, Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. And that was verse 15 also. So we see here that a man should not be coming with long hair, but he needs to be uncovered. And a woman needs to have a covering, but her long hair is a covering. And so that's pretty plain that the long hair is is important to God. Or he wouldn't have given us this instruction. And also we need to consider with the hair the natural beauty that God has given us. Now I know there's some people whose hairs fall out, and especially for a woman that is a shame. And so a wig would be, or a scarf, would be appropriate. But as far as possible, the natural is, is what God has given us is what is most beautiful. Just because it's natural simplicity. And there is a beauty in that when you're used to looking at natural simplicity. And living in the country, looking at the, at the beautiful natural simplicity of nature around you makes more distinct a difference when you see the false, especially in people. The natural simplicity is so beautiful when you're accustomed to it. And the fake and the put on and the trying to make yourself beautiful becomes actually vain. It's not beautiful. Okay, um, we're going, I told you last week that we were going to do some continuing in talking about some raw food. And we're going to wait and do the Back to Eden next week, both sections, next week's assignment, plus this is week's assignment. We're going to do them next week since we're running a little late on time. But the raw foods is something that somebody can go on, continuing on with the weight loss. You can go on the raw foods diet and lose weight and I have talked to people who have gone totally raw food and raw juicing to lose weight and they've told me that they were amazed how their skin didn't hang like other people who were very heavy and lost weight. I thought that was really interesting. And as we go through this, we'll find out why. Raw foods are alive. And as we look at the animal kingdom, all the birds and the beasts, Notice that they do not cook their food and they don't constantly have colds and flus and all these things. Um, they do get cancer, but that's probably because of the man-made foods that we uh, feed our animals, which is the, uh, the high-fat diet uh, that they have in their, their dog food and cat food. Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and medicine be your food. It says here that our cells, that we get, you know, our old cells die and our new cells are replaced. And so our bodies are dependent on the nutrients that we take in for that replacement of the cells. It says that our, um, our taste buds are changed or rebuilt every two weeks. That why, that's why we should, you know, taste a new food after two weeks. Maybe our taste buds 
will like them now. I've had people say they've gone on a carrot juice diet for a week, and after that, they didn't even like chips anymore. And so I know that our taste buds can change, and we can also train them to change. It says our layer of skin is changed every four weeks. Our heart muscles are replaced every eight weeks, and actually our bone structure is replaced about once a year. So we can change our skin, we can change the bone structure, our teeth, if we just start taking in these extreme nutrients, these fresh, raw nutrients. You know, the world eats about 90% cooked dead food. And the, the, their living cells are not receiving the proper building materials. And their cells are getting weaker. And every time they're getting replaced, they're getting replaced with dead, no enzyme material. And so they're degenerating fast. But if we stop eating these, you know, just dead food and start eating raw food, then we can actually see it in people's faces. Most of us have seen the video already, the fat, sick, and nearly dead. This is how these two men went uh, 60 days on total raw juices. And you could see their faces just change. And they got so vibrant looking. Okay, so meat is 19% protein. And eggs are 13% protein. And, and eggs are also 11% fat. But alfalfa sprouts are 35% protein. Soybean sprouts have 28% protein. And lentils and pea sprouts are 26% protein. So soybean sprouts have twice the protein of eggs and only one-tenth of the fat. Our body is self-healing. So it all has the potential to repair and heal itself. I mean, we can see that when we cut our skin. It, it will heal. And as we think about Adam and Eve, we know that God put them in the garden to dress it and to keep it, and that was their food. I don't think they ate cooked food back then. It says that cooking destroys 50% of the protein in our food and between 50 and 80% of the vitamins and minerals are also destroyed. It says pesticides break down into more toxic compounds through cooking, which are more easily assimilated into our bodies. And oxygen is lost and free radicals are produced. But the most important is that the enzymes are destroyed. Uh, enzymes are destroyed above in, in cooking above 118 degrees. And all of our vitamins and hormones do their work through enzymes. It says, uh, research has found that certain enzymes are able to liquefy pus for drainage and soften sticky mucus. So this is why the raw food diet and the juicing really helps with breaking down tumors. It says, enzymes are very necessary for the brain's function. The brain is deprived of alertness when food is not nourishing. Poor food takes energy away from the brain even while we're sleeping. Many times people are troubled with sleep due to enzyme deficient de denatured foods. And I have noticed that I am sleeping so well most of the time lately. I used to almost all my life have a hard time sleeping. And since I've gone on some raw food diets and cleaned my liver out, it says the body's enzymes can now break down the excess fat. So it takes enzymes to break that down uh, and protein and clogged arteries. People who are overweight or underweight are mostly suffering from a lack of enzymes. In 1930, Dr. Paul Kuchikoff found that when we eat cooked food, our bodies attack it with leukocytes, the white blood cells that are the cornerstone of our immune system. These cells bring enzymes to the cooked food in an attempt to break it down and get rid of it. Our bodies actually treat cooked food as a foreign invader. Now, there's a person that I've been reading her work and watched a couple of videos 
Tanya Savastya, and she's been on All Raw for 10 or 15 years. And she said that she had found that when she was off of raw food and on cooked food, that her white blood count was in the normal range. And then when she went off of it, that it dropped considerably because the body didn't have this invasion of cooked food, so you you didn't need all those white blood cells. And then she t- did an experiment. Either she did or she's telling about somebody who did it who was on all raw. Anyway, when they ate the cooked food, then it skyrocketed. So it's true through several sources that this happens with eating cooked food when you haven't eaten any um, cooked food for a while that it just skyrockets it says that no leukocytes are produced when living food is eaten it is a tremendous burden on our body to produce digestive enzymes and leukocytes it takes 10 metabolic enzymes to make one digestive enzyme so here we have seven advantages to eating raw One, raw foods are better quality, therefore you eat less to satisfy your nutritional needs. Raw foods have more flavor than cooked foods, so there is no need to add salt, sugar, spices, or other condiments that can irritate your digestion system or overstimulate other organs. Raw foods take very little preparation, so you spend less time in the kitchen. That depends on who you are. Some people like to make all these fancy raw food dishes. I like to eat them. But I'm not the type of person that spends a lot of time in the kitchen. So I just pick up fruit and pick up nuts and make some sprouts and eat those. And, and I've got it done. It says cleaning up after a raw meal is a snap. It says no baked on oils or crusty messes. Number five, eating a diet of raw foods can reverse or stop the advance of many chronic diseases, including heart disease and cancer. Six, a raw food diet can protect you from acute diseases such as colds, flu, measles, etc. Seven, eating raw saves you money on food, vitamins, pots, pans, appliances, doctor bills, drugs, and health insurance. That is, it saves you money on food if you grow it yourself because it can be more expensive eating all raw, I find, if unless you grow it yourself. And some examples, you know, even if people can, can go like 75 or 80% raw, that is better than, you know, the average American diet, which is 90% cooked. So an example of a breakfast for um, an 80% raw food would be, you know, some strawberries, some peaches, some blueberries, maybe a banana, and uh, some French toast that's made vegan style. Um... And a salad, you know, I use a big salad because lettuce doesn't have that much calories. So you're going to have to add for lunch some carrot juice, some things that are going to be substantial, some sprouts, and uh, some nuts, of course. And then you can have, you know, a small bowl of beans or a piece of bread. Make it simple so you're not going to eat so much cooked food. And for growing sprouts, it's very easy. You just soak them overnight, strain them. You can use a screen or a mesh, uh, put a rubber band around the lid, or you can use a canning lid, you know, because it's open. Just put a mesh screen in there and screw it on. Soak it overnight, keep it in the dark, uh, drain it in the morning, and then you, you drain it, uh, rinse it like two or three times a day, and keep it in a spot where you won't forget about it, because they're easy to forget about. And in about three to five days, depending on the seed, you've got some sprouts. And you can blend them in your smoothies. You can eat them with your salads. And they're a really good protein. And Daniel, actually, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said they lived on pulse, which was legumes. Now, I don't know if they were sprouted, but they could have been. It was pulse. Makes me think of pulse. Makes me think of living you can eat raw corn out of the garden. There's lots of things you can eat raw that you never thought uh, you could. Tomatoes are great. Lots of tomatoes. And, of course, you can eat the peas, the shelled peas in the shell. 
and you can grind up some beets and raw squash you can make that into with a little maker you can make a spaghetti out of your zucchini and crookneck squash the avocado is a great food for raw food because it has the calories lots of fruit mangoes papayas bananas things with high calorie fruit anyway i just encourage you to eat more raw food and to get those live enzymes and you will feel great we can go ahead and open up the line, see if you've got any questions about dress or the raw food. Kathy? Yes, hi. It's Sandy, hi. Um, do you know of anywhere where I can get thin cotton socks? Because I wear orthotics in my shoes that are very thick. That's why I always wear nylons, because I haven't found anything nice and thin that's cotton. Yes, Walmart has them. You got to go a certain time of the year. You have to go in the fall. And they'll have knee socks and they'll have anklets. I know this the style right now is a very it has been for a long time where you got these real short socks and your ankles are showing. That's the style. But oh, okay. it's it's not healthy at all. Uh we there's specific quotes about ankles should be well covered because, you know, just the veins going through there right close to the edge of the skin trying to keep your feet warm yeah i've got that's where i get mine i get them at walmart they're cheap a dollar a pair usually uh this time of year actually they go on sale that's when i get them dollar a pair okay i'll have to look and they're just with all the other stocks yes i haven't checked this year yet but all the other years you go in the late late uh you know early spring you can get them marked down then you won't be able to find them in the summer Mm -hmm. Any other co uh, questions or comments on the dress or the raw food? Okay, our assignment for next week is we're going to do the first half of diet and health because we're getting on to diet and that's quite a topic. So I figure we better just do half a chapter. 295 to 304. So that gives us nine pages anyway. And uh, in the Ministry of Healing, or you can listen to it online. I'll have it up in usually about three days after what after the assignments given for it. And back to Eden is going to be 275 to 284. We'll stop with uh, the beginning of cancer, and then we're going to do 10 pages on cancer the following week. And be familiar with the causes, symptoms, and treatments and cautions of these diseases. Our scripture memory verses for next week is Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 7. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 7. Proverbs 31, 21. That's the blessing chapter, if you observe and do all of his commandments. Proverbs 31, 21. Proverbs 31, verse 21. Matthew 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. Most of you have that one memorized. Genesis 1, 29. And that's another one everybody probably has memorized already. Genesis 1, 29. And the closing quote is... closing quote I'd like to read is on the dress that is most important. How important it is that we understand our privileges that we know that the Holy Spirit will work in our behalf and that we gladly receive the golden oil from heaven, which is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus will communicate his grace to every repenting, believing soul. We need to become better acquainted with the terms upon which salvation will be ours and better understand the relation which Christ sustains to us and to the Father. He has pledged himself to honor his son's name as we present it at the throne of his grace. We should consider the great sacrifice that was made in our behalf to purchase for us the robe of righteousness woven in the loom of heaven. He has invited us to the wedding feast and has provided for every one of us the wedding garment, the robe of righteousness has been purchased at an infinite cost. And how daring 
is the insult to heaven when one presents himself as a candidate for entrance at the wedding feast when wearing his own citizen's dress of self-righteousness. How greatly he dishonors God, openly showing contempt for the sacrifice made on Calvary. Of such a one it is written, and when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. No one will taste of the marriage supper of the Lamb who has not on a wedding garment. But John writes, Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Then, before it is eternally too late, let each one go to the heavenly merchant man for the white raiment, the eye salve, the gold, tried in the fire and the oil of heavenly grace let no one put off the day of preparation lest the call be made go forth to meet the bridegroom and you be found as were the foolish virgins with no oil in your vessels with your lamp that was youth instructor january 30 1896 you know all these things that are so important are symbols like our dress is symbol of, can be a symbol of the commandments, the word of God, bread, and you know, and also when marriage is has to do with our relationship with Christ. So let's take these things seriously, even though they may be outward, they may not be the the real thing, but let's represent Christ in everything we do all that we eat or drink or whatsoever we do let's give him the glory and uh, the closing verses is 1st Peter 2 verse 9 but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light Matthew 25, verses 42 and 43, the next verse, it says, For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. This medical missionary work is very important. Not that we're doing it because we have to, but we're doing it because... The love of God is in our hearts and we want to serve him and serve the people that he gave his life for. And Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. I say, okay, do we have any more comments or questions um, before we close with prayer? Uh, Rebecca, are you on? Okay, she had a testimony. Maybe I'll give it. But she is from Pleasant Hill, which is not too far from where we live here. And she's she's not an Adventist. But she has wanted to come and join our medical missionary class. And she has such a spirit of a medical missionary spirit that I haven't, I haven't seen in many people, in our own people, who have this message to do this. And she loves to help people and without price even. And she gave a friend a fomentation the other day. And her friend said that her, I guess it was her lung problem. She says she had never had such relief since she has had that fomentation that she's ever had in her life. So she's um, very thankful. These remedies do work and God does bless. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for 
the privilege of being fed by you. Lord, sometimes we get discouraged and we think that there's nobody out there that really wants this truth. And then we come, ac come across people that just are so thankful and it gives us so much joy. Just help us, dear Lord, not to be discouraged, but to, to go forward and to be the light shining, to not give up. Help us to realize that our dress, the looks on our faces, the simplicity, the purity that shines forth will reach people. And it's leaven in the world. It keeps the world from becoming so evil. Help us, Lord, to shine forth that leaven. Help us to have it in a mighty way. Please forgive us for our shortcomings, our doubtings, murmurings. Help us to rest in you, to be filled by you. Thank you for giving us the victory in what you've done. Thank you for the robe of righteousness that you have provided for us. You gave all heaven for this. And we're thankful for what you've done. Help us to show our thanks by you told us that if we love you, to keep your commandments and also to serve you. And we couldn't even begin to pay back a little bit of what you've, what you've done. It's greater than anything we can imagine or think. And we thank you. We pray and keep us to the next week and help us to find some people to uh, show forth your love to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, could you pray for us this week? We we have many um, health guests coming this week, three of them with cancer. So we need your prayers. And we have people that here are new and helping us out with the cooking that you will, that they will have grace and understanding and energy and that God will help us to have a harmonious work here and that will show his love. Thank you for your participation. And I'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Alrighty, bye-bye.